Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. We're going to give people a few minutes to in join in, in. and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Puerto Rico, Climate Catastrophe, Colonization, and the Struggle for Independence. My name is Alison Bodine, and I am a central organizer with Climate Convergence Metro Vancouver. Very happy uh, to welcome you all here. Um, I want to acknowledge that tonight's webinar is being broadcast from the traditional and unceded stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I know many of us are calling in from other parts of Metro Vancouver, Canada, or other parts of the world. And if you're residing on Indigenous territories, I hope that you will take a moment to reflect on the responsibility that we each have to Indigenous nations and to recognize, respect, and support their historic and inalienable rights. I also invite you to post um, a greeting into the chat. The chat is open about where you're joining from and uh, use the, the chat as a way to, to participate throughout the evening. I'm uh, 
really uh, excited for tonight's webinar to share with you about the important struggle of the people of Puerto Rico for climate justice, which is closely tied and, and, and you know, impossibly linked to the struggle for independence from US colonization. But before we begin, I want to introduce Coast Salish elder Kelly White. Uh, Kelly White uh, will be joining us uh, from uh, live as well here in the webinar, but uh, sent a video uh, in order to um, provide a welcoming and an opening uh, for tonight's webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and get that uh, queued up and uh, give a, a big heaping of gratitude to uh, Coast Salish Kelly White uh, for joining us uh, here today and helping us to start this webinar in a good way. And then I'll go through the program and, and give people a bit of an idea of what to expect uh, here tonight. Um, I'll also just quickly say that the webinar is being broadcast on Facebook and will later be put on YouTube. And we'll put the link in the chat if there's folks that you want to share with on your social media networks. H-O-Y-L-C-M-C-T-O-C-I-M, in the spirit of the highest honor for our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico and the world supporters as well. Hi, Chika Chetquimin Tomi, thank you. We're grateful and Kiachitin, we're uh, of the great spirit's belief of us that we can constitute the faith to carry on a good revolution for the rights to life of all life. And we thank our uh, brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico for leading that uh, honor without want and without need and to in respects in the highest honor of those out there in the front line uh, song of the Eagles, thanking them for taking our messages on high. Nobody goes higher than the Eagle. And we thank the Puerto Rican families and the support groups for carrying that message so that the world can pay attention. We thank the Creator for the umbilical cord of uh, cleansing with our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico and thank them for standing up with the revolution strong for our rights to life and now it's up to you in the highest of the honors healing our nations of united resistance to apathy one love with Puerto Rico Thank you uh, very much to Coast Salish Elder Kelly White. Um, as I said, uh, she will hopefully be joining us here in the Zoom space as well, but uh, very honored to have uh, that video just recorded a, a, you know, about an hour ago uh, to open up tonight's webinar. Uh, tonight, uh, the discussion that we are having on uh, Puerto Rico uh, is um, you know, organized and, and hosted by Climate Convergence Metro Vancouver. We are a climate justice organization uh, here in the Lower Mainland. Uh, we have uh, organized you know, actions on the streets, 
uh, large postering campaigns, um, you know, uh, do a lot of work to do uh, outreach and education uh, within uh, the Lower Mainland and beyond. And also during the pandemic uh, time, especially, uh, did what we could to bring the international climate justice struggle into the focus and to take advantage of the fact that now it is uh, so much more comfortable for us to connect with our co-fighters around the world over Zoom and learn more about their struggles and for them to learn more about what we're doing here um, in order to build this international climate justice movement. And I've been thinking a lot about this international movement, of course, in the context of what has just opened this week, which is the United Nations COP27, which began in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, uh, just two days ago. And so uh, we're in a situation where there's this international climate just or climate conference taking place, uh, which we can talk about later and, and need to continue to discuss, you know, which is sponsored by um, some of the world's biggest climate destroyers, massive corporations such as Coca-Cola, while we are here, you know, relating one on one uh, with our fellow co-fighters and building the true international climate justice movement uh, that is needed uh, to bring about system change, not climate change, and to confront this climate catastrophe. Uh, here in British Columbia and uh, in other uh, developed countries, uh, it is often uh, said that we do not feel the impacts of the climate crisis. Uh, you know, there's spurts of, of crisis, heat waves, uh, there is flooding, uh, there are horrible uh, weather events that, and of course, um, other impacts that, that affect mostly poor working, oppressed people, indigenous people, uh, people of color, but a lot of folks can really continue to ignore the fact that the climate catastrophe is everywhere. And that's not the case with Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is an island um, in the Caribbean uh, that is colonized by the United States. And every day people in Puerto Rico face the, that reality that they don't have their self-determination, their right to, turn, uh, to choose their own government, their independence. As we'll learn about today, you know, they don't have the rights to even determine who runs their electrical grid. And they face, um, therefore, a, a catastrophe that has many uh, different, uh, you know, um, impacts, but it comes from the same source. And that is continued colonization and uh, climate change. The people of Puerto Rico are facing this climate catastrophe brought on by the rapidly changing climate and continued colonization by the United States. And that's why Climate Convergence wanted to invite you, everyone here today, to learn more about what we can do to support Puerto Rico's struggle for independence and their struggle for climate justice. I'm really honored to have with us here um, Monisha Rios, who is going to uh, speak following a few short videos that will help us get some context into our discussion here today. But also just want to invite people to think about um, how we can turn today's webinar into action and into solidarity with our with our fellow co-fighters in Puerto Rico. From the 1940s until 2003, the U.S. Navy used Vieques as a training ground for war plummeling the island with bombs as it conducted military training operations. And the Navy of Canada was often right beside them, participating in war games and bombing as well. We're talking about 900 kilogram bombs, napalm, depleted uranium and other toxic, toxic munitions being deployed only kilometers away from people who lived on the island and still live there today. The U.S. Navy was finally kicked out of Vieques in 2003 after a powerful struggle by the people of Puerto Rico and of Vieques, but it's still a toxic place. A Superfund site persists, and the people of Vieques, as we'll learn more about today, face poisoning and terrible health impacts, as well as the destruction of the natural environment. In Hurricane Maria, of course, a recent hurricane has also had a big impact on the people of Puerto Rico, but Hurricane Maria in 2017, nearly 5,000 people died in this hurricane. And that is not uh, just a cause, uh, you know, is not, is not to be expected from a natural disaster. This is something that's brought on 
by the impact, as I said before, of colonization and of the natural disaster, those two disasters coming together. Multinational pharmaceutical companies get millions of dollars in tax breaks. And this comes with the illegal dumping of toxic waste, pollution, and depletion of groundwater. I don't want to go into details, but I did want to just introduce some of what daily life in Puerto Rico is like before we go into the film. And to say just briefly um, that this webinar will also focus on the government of Canada's role and corporations based in Canada's role in this continued destruction. So keep that in your mind as we watch these following videos. Um, we're going to watch two videos here today, and we'll put the links in the chat so you can find out more about the, the directors and also um, particularly uh, the first video, uh, the, the director has produced a number of films if you want to learn more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play those. Um, one is about kind of overdevelopment in Puerto Rico. It has uh, information about the area we were just discussing, Vieques and Colibre. And uh, also uh, then we will talk more and, and see a video about Vieques, the island I was describing that was bombed continuously by the U.S. Uh, military and their allies, including Canada. Um, so thank you to everyone that's been posting in the chat. It's really excellent to see you all here. Um, we're going to watch these videos uh, together. They are about 30 minutes, but I think uh, will give us, uh, put us in a really good place to uh, have a good uh, discussion following Manisha's presentation, and um, we'll uh, be able to go from there. So let me just get those two videos queued up. <laughs> You're looking at one of the top beaches in the world, Flamenco. You're looking at one of the top beaches in the world, Flamenco a spot popular with tourists and a piece of paradise that generations of Puerto Ricans have called home. Oye, flamenco es mi amor. But there was a time that the people who were born here could not come to this beach because the United States military took it over and forced the residents out. The people of Culebra fought back and won access to their natural resources again. But almost four decades after that victory, there's another threat. La amenaza presente son los grandes desarrolladores. And they're ready to fight again. De aquí somos, de aquí nos quedamos, no nos vamos para ningún lado. Culebra is an island only seven miles long and two miles wide, but a strategic location in the Caribbean, year-round warm weather, and beautiful landscapes have made it a magnet for outside interests. So much that the United States wanted to buy it from Spain in the 1860s. That didn't work out, but then the U.S. took possession of Puerto Rico, and within a few years, the Navy was training in Culebra. By the time Lourdes Feliciano was in middle school, U.S. Navy bombings were a part of daily life. Había mucho miedo. O sea, cada vez que explotaba una bomba, toda la escuela vibraba. Culebrenses still remember the effects of the Navy's presence on their island. Accidents like the one that resulted in Don Isaac Espinosa losing an arm and an eye. Families forced out of their homes to make space for the military, and access denied to spaces that used to be public, like Flamenco Beach. No podíamos disfrutar de flamenco porque ellos eran los diseñadores de la playa. O sea, el que pasara flamenco era arrestado o era sacado a la fuerza de las áreas. By the 1970s, the people of Culebra had had enough. They marched. They committed civil disobedience, and their mayor, Ramon Feliciano, known as Monching, went to Washington, D.C. and found a lawyer willing to sue the Navy. Don Monching was also Lourdes's dad. La victoria costó mucho, muchas lágrimas, mucha vicisitud, de verdad. They won, and in 1975, the Navy left Culebra. 
that people had access to their beach again. Today, you can still see the war tanks the Navy left behind in Flamenco. On the eastern side of Flamenco, there's an area known as El Muellecito. After the Navy left, it became a favorite spot for the community to get together and celebrate special occasions. That was until a company bought the land that gave the locals access to the beach and argued that path was part of their private property. The company was Puerto Rico Land and Fruit, whose principal partner was Victor Gonzalez Barahona. He's also the president of Windmar Renewable Energy, a company that sells solar panels in Puerto Rico. After the company bought the land, they built a concrete fence that closed off the path. And once again, the community fought back. Even Monchin, the mayor who sued the Navy, was there again, this time confronting Gonzalez. The case ended up in court, and Gonzalez eventually took down the wall. But his issues with the community didn't end there. Gonzalez built a property in front of Flamenco Beach that he rents short term on Airbnb for more than $3,600 a reservation. No debió haberse construido esa estructura en ese sitio. Edwin Hernández Delgado is a marine biologist who has been studying Culebra's underwater ecosystems for more than 30 years. He says deforestation and development without proper controls is harming critical habitats of endangered species. Y el problema es que se están aprobando una serie de proyectos en áreas sumamente sensitivas donde lo que quiera que hagas, no importa ser la playa o ser la montaña, instantáneamente, después de un aguacero fuerte, tiene un impacto en la costa. Culebrenses documented bulldozers clearing paths on González's property in 2017, and the crystal clear water of El Muellecito turned brown. González didn't respond to requests to interview him for this story. O sea, la escorrentía siempre va a haber, pero si hubiese vegetación, la cantidad de sedimento fino que correría hacia la laguna sería ínfima porque estaría cubierto de vegetación. Y en términos entonces de los sistemas costeros, pues lo que tiene es un aguacero de sedimento llegando a, a la costa. So what does it matter? Well, when sediment ends up in the water, it smothers the coral reefs, potentially bringing pollution and disease. And the reefs are important because they protect the coast from waves, storms, and floods. They're also home to the fish that culebrenses eat. And corals have the important function of absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. Not to mention their beauty attracts people from all over the world to Culebra. A pesar de todo eso que hemos conversado, la isla de Culebra es uno de los lugares que todavía sostiene uno de los arrecifes en mejor desarrollo de Puerto Rico. Así de grave es la situación en la isla grande. O sea, nosotros tenemos diversidad y unos paisajes submarinos que yo considero todavía épicos. Estamos tratando de matar la gallina de los huevos de oro. Continuamos con un patrón de desarrollo que no es sostenible. There's one particular tool that is being used to fast track developments. It's called categorical exclusion. And when it's approved, proponents can skip having to do a detailed evaluation of a project's environmental impact. It's the mechanism that was used to fast track the construction of a pool in the town of Rincón. That was the case where an endangered turtle was found nesting in the construction site back in July, and that led to protests and confrontations. On one side were environmentalists and activists who believed the construction was too close to the ocean. On the other side were the owners of the condos who claimed they had permission to build on that piece of land because they argue it's part of their private property. Ultimately, the government agency in charge of planning in Puerto Rico decided to take back the permit because they believe it was issued illegally. See, categorical exclusions are meant for actions that are routine and in places where it can be predicted, they won't have a significant effect on the environment. And that's why, according to the government's own rules, categorical exclusions for construction or reconstruction projects are not supposed to be approved in areas that are at risk of flooding areas that are ecologically sensitive. 
areas where there are endangered plants or animals, or areas where ecological systems could be affected. And the area where the Pool and Rincón was being built checked off at least two of those, according to the Puerto Rico Planning Board. But again, it was approved anyway. So the question I had was, is this happening in other parts of Puerto Rico? Are categorical exclusions being approved where they shouldn't be? So I requested the information from the government. And Alfredo Montañez Acuña, a graduate student of planning at the University of Puerto Rico, analyzed it. This is what he found in Culebra. The government approved more than 250 categorical exclusions in the island of Culebra in the last eight years, or 95% of the requests they received. According to Alfredo's analysis, at least 30 of those could be illegal because they were for construction or reconstruction projects approved in places that fell in at least one of the four categories, while 12 were approved in areas that had at least two out of the four, just like the case in Rincón. Si hay un municipio que esto no debería estar sucediendo, es Culebra, por lo especial que es, por su historia, por su valor ecológico eh, y por la de alta dependencia de la comunidad de tener playa, arrecife saludable, una calidad de agua adecuada. Alfredo says the data validated what the community had already been observing and documenting. Pudiésemos esperar un colapso de los arrecifes de 10 a, a, a 30 años y seguimos como vamos. So, mi llamado es, aquí están los datos. Gracias. Tuvimos acceso a ellos, pudimos presentarlos, pudimos analizarlos rápidamente para dejarles saber, hey, hay, 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 aquí hay un posible impacto ambiental significativo a largo plazo que se puede evitar. And the thing is that Culebra has a one-of-a-kind tool to avoid environmental damage. It's the only municipality in Puerto Rico with its own conservation and development authority, commonly known as ACDIC. Because after the Navy left Culebra, the government admitted the island had special characteristics and needed additional protection. Es la herramienta que nosotros tenemos como municipio para que no se desarrolle desmedidamente. ACDEC is made up of the mayor and four other members with special powers to protect Culebra's environment. But that's on paper. Se convirtió en una ley, una ley muerta, como ha pasado muchas leyes en Puerto Rico, que hay leyes que, nos, que no la ejercen. In fact, the Puerto Rican government is not supposed to approve projects in Culebra without ACDIC's endorsement. But the mayor says it's happening anyway. La ley existe, pero esa ley se está violando. Es correcto. I reached out to the agency in charge of approving permits in Puerto Rico. They were the ones who provided the data, but they did not respond to my questions regarding the categorical exclusions approved in Culebra. And at the heart of this debate is also a question about what kind of island Culebra should be. A vacation destination where tourism is prioritized, or a town with a strong local community that welcomes visitors. The answer to that question will determine if Culebra's natural resources are protected for future generations. It will also determine if the needs of the local population like education and housing are met. Because just like in other parts of Puerto Rico, right now short-term rentals are taking over. What used to be housing options for culebrenses have been turned into Airbnbs, and some locals say they're being displaced. No se sienten desplazados, están siendo desplazados. Esa es la palabra correcta. La gente no tiene donde quedarse. Gente de aquí, gente que su familia son de aquí. Jan Lebron's family has been in Culebra for several generations. Mi tatara, tatara, tatara abuela, llevada de aquí, traída por los españoles, Felipa Serrano. Felipa Serrano was a woman born into slavery who became Culebra's midwife after gaining her freedom. And six generations later, Jan was born. Now he can't find a place to live that he can afford, and he doesn't want to have to leave. ¿Cómo yo me voy a ir de donde yo nací? donde mi familia se ha criado, se ha esforzado, ¿entiendes? Jan works with an organization dedicated to conserving corals. He says he wants to live in a culebra that puts nature and its people first. Ahora mismo ves a San Tomás, San Martín, todas estas islas vírgenes cercanas, que son familiares también, tenemos familias acá y allá de ellos. Son comercializadas. Tan pronto tú te bajas de ahí llegas al puerto, son comercializadas. ¿ves? Cabeza, 
Qué bandolero, eh. And I can tell you that one of the things that is so beautiful about spending time in Culebra with the locals is how everyone knows each other. And I mean really know each other. It's such a small community that they talk about other culebrenses like their family. They don't want to lose that. Todas estas grandes intereses pues vienen con el fin de, de aumentar su riqueza. Culebra para nosotros es más que una riqueza económica. En nuestra vida, en nuestro diario vivir. Y no le vamos a permitir, si ellos piensan que van a aumentar su riqueza, a cuenta de desplazarme y sacarnos y ellos quedarse, no va a ser así. Si hay que volver a los tiempos de, de pelea, pues re, de, regresaremos a lo mismo. I cannot end this video without thanking every single person who made this story possible. This investigation was entirely crowdfunded, and it just wouldn't have been possible without the more than 300 people who joined this effort. It makes me really happy to say this is our story. So what's next? We want to expand this investigation throughout Puerto Rico. We want to ask the same questions we asked in Culebra and other municipalities. So we're going to leave the crowdfunding open, and I'll post a link to that in the description in case you want to support us moving forward. Last time I I also told you we're working on a database and a map where you can see what has been approved throughout Puerto Rico. We're working on that and that's coming soon. So again, thank you and stay tuned for the next video. I'm in one of the most beautiful places in the Caribbean. This is the island of Vieques, which is in Puerto Rico. But what you can't see are the thousands of active explosives left behind here by the U.S. Navy. That's because for decades, the Navy trained for war by bombing this island. And the way they're going about cleaning up their toxic mess is actually hurting the locals and the environment. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, which means residents here are American citizens. But as a small island off the main island, Vieques has suffered years of neglect. And now, with no main hospital after Hurricane Maria and little economic opportunity, many are leaving. At the same time, wealthy Americans from the mainland are buying up prime real estate. This house is listed for $4.5 million. Wow. Yeah. And it's worth every penny. Even though parts of the island are still off limits. Yeah, I don't want to go over there and get blown up. Nobody wants to go over there and get blown up, that's for sure. This peaceful trail I'm on is where the Navy trained for war and dropped hundreds of thousands of bombs for years. Today, it's a national wildlife refuge, which is ironic because it's simultaneously a Superfund site full of toxic munitions that are still littered all over the land and sea. And I've actually seen signs like this that say explosive hazard everywhere. Until 2003, this refuge was a U.S. Navy range, where the military trained for conflicts like World War II, the Vietnam War, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. The land, which makes up one half of the island, is now one of the most hazardous waste sites in the U.S. The Navy's been cleaning up the remnants of their war games by blowing up old bombs, a process called open detonation, which they insist is safe. But some residents are concerned about the health effects from the chemicals released by each new explosion. What type of munitions are we talking about exactly that the Navy left behind here? They have basically used everything but the kitchen sink. This is Daniel Rodriguez. He's the EPA's point person in Vieques. The EPA is overseeing the cleanup. You can find large munitions, um, like 2,000-pound bombs, um, and munitions as small as uh, 20 millimeters. So you had all kind of training activities here for mortars, drop from planes, shoot from boats. These are munitions that were not disposed on the ground. They were fire, and they didn't function. The Navy has admitted to using toxic chemicals in Vieques, including napalm and depleted uranium. The EPA lists over a dozen contaminants on the island. I think that we happen to be collateral damage to the military agenda and to the federal government agenda. Mirna and Ismail are local activists who spent decades trying to kick out the Navy. Now they're fighting for their lives. I am a cancer survivor. However, in my family, my husband passed away. That was a total metastasized cancer. And his problem then with the heavy metals was arsenic and uranium. And I had the uranium also. These are your medical records from 2000 when the Navy was still here. And your hair sample showed levels of mercury. Thank you. What do you think that was from? Well, from the Navy. 
Ismail was one of over 200 residents who were tested for mercury, aluminum, cadmium, lead, and arsenic exposure, all present in high explosives. Except for arsenic, 33% of those tested had higher levels than the EPA considers safe. We have no industry here, so where could all the contamination come from? I believe, as do most of the people here believe, that is because of the uh, military practices, the bombing and the fact that they were experimenting here with non-conventional weapons. The rates of cancer in Vieques are higher than the rest of Puerto Rico, historically up to 27%, though it's hard to track today since so many people have left the island. And to get treatment, patients have to travel on an unreliable ferry to the main island. Ismail makes that trip regularly for dialysis. Para yo ir a atenderme, me tengo que ir hoy a las dos, a las pelón, a las tres de la tarde. En estos días no hay mucha garantía. En estos días muchos enfermos eh, no rehusan moverse de vía que prefieren cancelar sus quimioterapias, sus radioterapias, sus tratamientos, porque no se atreven a aventurarse a viajar porque de allá viene un gentío y no se nos garantiza a nosotros el poder regresar. Yo recuerdo las bombas nos pasaban por encima, los cañones nos pasaban por encima. You've saved all of these memories from your fight against the Navy. We stop amphibious landing, we stop amphibious landing. Whoa. One incident in particular ignited a movement. In 1999, a Marine fighter jet accidentally dropped two 500-pound bombs on a Navy observation post, killing a local security guard and wounding four others. In response, protesters occupied the Navy base, stopping them from conducting exercises for an entire year. Aquí hubo multiplicidad de apoyo a nivel mundial, no solamente en Puerto Rico ni en Estados Unidos. Stop the bombing. Until the military forcibly cleared the encampments in 2000. President George W. Bush ordered the Navy to leave by 2003. This was supposed to initiate a cleanup process, but 16 years later, locals say the cleanup hasn't been transparent or efficient. How much has the Navy cleaned up and how much is left? The Navy has surface clear. Uh, a little bit over 4,000 acres. 4,000 out of 10,000? Out of 10,000. Surface clear. So that doesn't even include what's underground and what's in the water? That doesn't include what's underground. So there's a long way to go before this place gets cleaned up? There is some more to go, exactly. When will they finish? That date varies from time to time. There are numbers being tossed around that could be taken to um, 2030. Why is it taking so long? It's a very... Uh, risky type of uh, cleanup. Uh, when you're dealing with munitions, you can't go that fast. What grade would you give the Navy so far? They're doing a good job. A? They're doing a good job. Hardly any independent studies have been carried out to examine the military's impact on the public's health. The Navy consistently points to one controversial government study that concluded there's no negative impact. But multiple scientists, researchers, and locals have seriously questioned the findings. Cancer is very prevalent in here. This is Dr. Pagan. She's one of the only general physicians in Vieques. I asked her why people here are more likely to develop cancer than those on the main island. There must be some carcinogenic higher than the rest of the island in why? here in Vieques. Oh, because of the bombing. So if you live in Vieques, there's a higher chance that you have cancer. If you have cancer, you cannot get treatment here and you have to go to the main island and going to the main island it's in and of problem. itself is a big hardship. That feels like a hopeless situation. Yes, that's why many, most of them move. They find another um, place to live. Meanwhile, wealthy Americans from the mainland are finding their second homes in Vieques. You get this nice eastern view into Isabel Segunda, the lighthouse, and Culebra. This is Tom. He moved here from Idaho nearly 20 years ago. Today, he's one of the most successful real estate developers on the island, selling homes like these. This house is listed for 4.5 million. Wow. Yeah. And it's worth every penny. It's the type of place where you can be completely private. You're, you're behind walls. You're on one of the most prominent locations in Vieques, right on the oceanfront, on the cliffs. It's a spectacular setting. Who are your typical customers for the places you sell? 
Well, I always think of my customer base as people who are people who are searching for second homes or successful people. So I get a large percentage of doctors, for example, and, and lawyers, professional people. Tom says his clients never ask about contamination from the Superfund site. He also says real estate sales have rebounded after Hurricane Maria. So what's like your pitch to someone who has a good amount of money from the U.S. mainland who's like, mm, I'm thinking of buying a house on Vieques? I like to show that I put my money where my mouth is, that I've invested. Um, I like to talk about taxes, which are very low here. Um, very, just a fraction of what you would pay for a similar home in the States. How do you respond to skeptics who would accuse people like you of gentrifying Vieques? I guess we are doing some gentrifying, but I, I really tend to focus on the positive things that we're doing for the community. Education is getting better. Um, animals are getting treated better. We are a part of the community. We're giving back, and I feel like I'm via Kinsey. But other residents see things differently. Sobre Vieques, a 20 años de la muerte de David Sanes Sotina. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos días. Buenos días. Habla español. Un poquito. Excelente. This is Robert Rabin. He was arrested five times for protesting the Navy. He now directs the Vieques Historical Archives and hosts a radio show. Gentrification now is more a danger to the, the very existence of the culture and community of Vieques as we know it. So you believe that after Hurricane Maria, there's been more gentrification? Yes. Why? <laughs> yes, because people tend to leave. People in Puerto Rico, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of people have left Puerto Rico to the, go to the United States. That means they're selling their property cheap and the same is happening here. Uh, people are looking for other alternatives. And so they're, you know, the realtors, speculators, investors, uh, all part of the dynamics of gentrification are taking advantage of the post Maria situation. Robert says the Navy cleanup is yet another example of locals being excluded from economic opportunities. We had hoped that in the cleanup process would really mean a lot of economic benefit for the community, but of the hundreds of millions of dollars that the federal government has spent on cleanup so far, uh, the greatest amount of that is going to large U.S. corporations that are in control of the process. The Navy didn't want to talk on camera. In an email, they defended open detonation as the safest process for the site workers handling the munitions and said the explosions pose no health risks to the public. You know, I'm gonna I wanted to hear what Puerto Rico Governor Ricardo Rosselló had to say about this. I am very much committed to Vieques and I recognize all of the challenges that they have in the past. Do you believe that the EPA and the Navy have gone about the cleanup of the contamination in the safest way possible to the citizens there? It is, again, inherent in this uh, colonial conversation that we've had. If we've had two senators and five House representatives, which would be the case for Puerto Rico, you would have oversight hearings. You would have, uh, you know, a hammer in Washington to make sure that some of these things move forward. Unfortunately, we don't, whether it be, you know, access to clean water, whether it will be the poverty levels, but we're always going to be at a disadvantage relative to the states. On our last day in Vieques, the Navy conducted another open detonation. A fisherman caught the explosions on camera from his boat. For those in Vieques who dedicated their lives to reclaiming their land, the fight is far from over. Eh, nuestras cuatro demandas eran de militarización, de, de contaminación, devolución y desarrollo de Vieques. And how many of those have been met so far? None. Zero. Ya Mirna te contestó, ninguna. Yeah. No. Hey guys, it's Dina here in Vieques, which the locals call a colony of the colony. Tell me what you thought about this video in the comments. Do you believe the Navy and the EPA when they say everything is safe here? And would you feel safe living here? Let me know and please like this video and share it. And stay tuned for my next Direct From episode where I go inside Monsanto's operations in Puerto Rico. They're doing a lot here. I'm in one of the most beautiful places in the Caribbean. All right, so those are uh, two videos to help us set the context. Um, I, I think we all probably inherently know the answer to the question about if we believe the U.S. Navy or not, but um, that is one of the things that uh, Monisha Rios is able to address <laughs> in, her, in her presentation. Um, but uh, I, I think that's both those videos are just very helpful for us to uh, get a, a snapshot of of what the struggle for climate justice and independence may look like in Puerto Rico. Um, the links have been posted in the chat and we'll share them afterwards. And um, that was uh, 
great to have uh, those videos today. Um, and now we've finally reached the point for our featured guest. Um, I am really grateful uh, to have Monisha Rios here with us. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to meet briefly while working on um, projects for, for peace uh, in other countries, um, but have recently kind of reconnected around um, wanting to um, be able to have this discussion about especially Canada's role in the ongoing colonization of Puerto Rico and in impeding the people of Puerto Rico's ability to fight for uh, their for climate justice and for social justice and for their independence. Um, Monisha is uh, has a doctorate, a uh, master's in social work. She is a Puerto Rican psychologist, social worker, and an anti-imperialist veteran of the U.S. Army. Since 2013, she has been investigating the American Psychological Association's 104-year role in the weaponization and militarization of psychology in service to imperialism. Monisha works to expose the psychological warfare component of U.S.-led hybrid warfare with a special focus on the narratives used to destabilize people's movements toward liberation from capitalist imperialist oppression in Latin America, the Caribbean, and beyond. And I think we saw a bit of that psychological warfare in the, the interviews and the faces of, of people in the videos. Um, she's on the executive of the U.S. Peace Council, is the founding director of Centro Solidario in Puerto Rico, it, which is a local, national, and international community project, and is the current president of SOLI Puerto Rico, a, net a network of Puerto Ricans in the struggle for peace and international solidarity. Uh, so yeah, really, really uh, great to have you here. A fighter for climate and, and social justice and uh, to have you share with us here today. Um, Monisha is going to speak and then we'll have some time for uh, some brief announcements, including an update from the Stony Creek camp, uh, which is uh, currently uh, part of the struggle against the Trans Mountain Pipeline here in uh, Vancouver and in Burnaby, British Columbia, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Uh, before it gets too late for everyone out on the East Coast or on the Atlantic seaboard. So without further ado, Monisha Rios, welcome. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, everyone. Um, before I get started, I want to make sure I set my timer. <laughs> so how much time should I set it for? I think I think 15 minutes is great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so that was a lot of information, um, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, I am Viequense. Uh, my family comes from Vieque. Um, my, the reason I was born outside of Puerto Rico is because of the bombing. Um, many of my family members are sick. Um, and actually I'm so moved um, from both of these videos, um, especially because I got to see Bob. <laughs> Bob passed away recently. Bob was a mentor to me and he is actually who started this, this project with me that I'll tell you about shortly. Um, he's the reason I rematriated. Um, so he was a dear friend and mentor and I miss him. Um, but Bob is not the only one that we've lost. We've lost many, many people uh, that you've seen in this video are no longer with us. Um, so I have a lot that I can share with you all. Um, I think for starters, I would like to focus on other ways that Canada is involved in the current wave of colonialism taking place here that is making life harder here and helping to facilitate uh, more removal of our people in addition to uh, making it nearly impossible for us to survive climate change with dignity. Um, so some of you may or may not have heard of a company called Luma Energies. Um, in your neck of the woods, you may have heard of a company called Atco. I'm going to pull up some information for you here uh, and use this to explain further um, what beyond the bombings, um, beyond NATO, 
the relationship that Canada has to harm being caused here in Puerto Rico. Okay, so this is ATCO's website, and this is an article from 2020 boasting about their win in Puerto Rico. ATCO is a co-parent of this new company called Luma Energy, which has been a nightmare for us here. Um, this newly formed company was developed in partnership with a Texas-based US company. Um, basically, these two companies have taken over our energy grid, privatized it, um, and people have, their homes have burned down. <laughs> people, people have died in their homes from the electrical fires or have been severely injured, including children. Um, the majority of Puerto Rico experiences frequent and ongoing blackouts. Um, while um, this particular group of Canadians profits, um, they ha have were supposed to have prepared our grid for uh, to be able to survive hurricanes, to be able to survive any type of inclement weather. Um, but it's just been problematic from day one. Supposedly also, um, I should be able to play this video with sound, right? Let's see, may not. Is it playing for you? Uh, it's just loading still. It just depends. There were two check boxes when you started to share your screen. If you checked them, it should work. Let me stop and start again, just to be sure. Apologies, okay. everyone. Okay, I had not checked it, so I'm glad that we redid it. Okay. Integrity, agility, caring, collaboration. These aren't just ATCO's corporate values. They're the values that convinced Puerto Rico to award us the opportunity to modernize and operate their electrical system after the devastating hurricanes of 2017. Together with Quanta, we developed a plan that showcases our ability to provide a reliable and sustainable electrical system for the island. Our proven track record and comprehensive plan clearly demonstrates our unique operational expertise and unwavering commitment to safety. But that wasn't enough for us, because the ATCO way is to go above and beyond. With that in mind, our plan will employ and empower local communities and ultimately support the long-term prosperity of Puerto Rico. It all starts with a new company, Luma, that will bring ATCO's expertise and community-focused solutions to the island. From the prairies to Puerto Rico and everywhere in between, you can always count on us. Garbage. <laughs> Um, no, they have not um, acted with integrity. They have not modernized and updated. They have not um, hired local, in some areas, yes, with some people that they approve of, yes. Um, however, the majority of the folks who were working um, with our electric, electrical company um, when it was not privatized don't have jobs. Most of the, the line workers don't have jobs now. And Luma uh, has effectively brought in scabs from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, um, the Florida chapter 222, when our union was protesting and striking um, and demanding better, um, they brought in other union workers from the state. So it's a very poignant example of how settler colonialism works. Um, there's absolutely no consideration for the, uh, the I almost said well-being in Spanish, I apologize, for the well-being of <laughs> our people. Um, so aside from Canada contributing to the deaths and generational illnesses, birth defects, and so on um, of via cancer, um, Canada is now contributing to, <laughs> um, and I apologize for laughing. I'm just so, you know, um, 
yeah. So they're again facilitating the privatization of our essential service, the energy grid. So this privatization comes um, along with, and I'm going to share my screen one more time for you. You may or may not have heard of PROMESA, the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act signed into law by President Barack Obama in 2016 that was supposed to have done something to remedy Puerto Rico's so-called debt, um, which is any legal debt that has not been audited. And um, instead of the people who created the debt paying it off, the, the people of Puerto Rico are told it's our responsibility to pay off this so-called debt that we had nothing to do with at all whatsoever. So what PROMESA is, it's an IMF style, IMF is an international monetary fund style austerity plan. So the same exact tactics that are being used in other countries that the US and its allies have their eyes on and want to dig their claws into, they're doing here. The difference is that we are not entirely sovereign. Therefore, they cannot do some of some of the things that they're doing in other countries, but they're doing most of it here. So one of the things that PROMESA does was to install this fiscal oversight and management board. Basically, this is our new colonial ruler. Um, whereas when the US first uh, what acquired Puerto Rico after going to war with another empire um, and, and taking our lands and our people without our consent, um, there was a military dictatorship. And then there was a US appointed governorship dictatorship. And then in the fifties, when uh, direct colonialism was out of style, the US changed it up with the UN's cooperation and decided to take us off the list of non-governing non-self-governing territories with this ridiculous status that we have now, the freely associated state status. So there's nothing free about the association. Then we, we got a proxy government where supposedly we are the ones voting for our, our, our leaders, but just like in other countries where the US is currently intervening and installing its own puppets, we have US puppets in government. They just have Puerto Rican names and Puerto Rican faces. Um, but now, now we have an economic dictatorship through the Financial Oversight and Management Board of Puerto Rico, which we affectionately call La Junta. Um, so MUMA relates to La Junta and relates to these austerity measures and this supposed um, debt restructuring plan because uh, part of that plan is to privatize everything cancel uh, pensions, privatize everything under the sun, and again, um, make it impossible for us to survive here, which then again, makes it a more ideal place for people like the gentleman, the realtor in the video about Vieque, who are making a lot of money selling off our ancestral lands to people who, who don't care about us. Um, so there is a lot of information. Um, some folks whose names I recognize from Puerto Rico are adding information to the chat for you. And thank you all for doing that um, because there is a lot of information. Um, but I also only have four minutes left. <laughs> so I, I want to tell you all about what Centro Solidario is. So all of the information that you received through these videos, the fact that Vieques has no hospital, the fact that both Culebra and Vieque are recovering from between the two of them 90 something years of being used as a practice range and receiving all of the war violence that the rest of the world receives. Um, the, the, the health crisis in Puerto Rico has led to the closure of maternity wards that Viequenses and Culebrenses would have access that are close to the ferry port here on the Big Island, which is now where I am. I actually left the Vieque. Um, to, to start this project. Um, so basically, Centro Solidario, the local solidarity component, consists of this, this two-story house. The bottom is more like, a, um, like an efficiency or a studio apartment, and the upstairs where I'm at now has two bedrooms. 
a large living room, a very large bathroom, and a decent sized kitchen. It is about 10 minutes away from the ferry port. And what we are trying to do with this house is fix it up to make it safe and comfortable and accessible for a variety of mobility needs to host, to basically be the people's Airbnb, to host people from Vieques and Culebra for free when they need to come to the Big Island to access health services, when they come for their cancer treatments, when they come for their um, uh, cardiology appointments, when they come to have surgery, when they come to, to, to get their, um, I'm sorry, what is it? When you're pregnant and you are gonna have a baby, you go to which doctor again? The obstetrician, <laughs> thank you. So to go to, to all of this and then also to have a place to, to rest before getting on the boat. Um, it's a 45 minute to an hour, sometimes 30 minutes, depending on the weather, but it's a rough ride. So where we are at now is um, we don't have resources to be able to do this. I've been using my um, personal resources as a disabled veteran, basically my disability money is how we got the house and it's how the majority of repairs and things have been taking place. The problem with Luma has led to even greater problems with this house. Um, and it, it's basically stopped everything, uh, all the forward momentum. We're no longer able to host people. Um, so happening all of the time, um, Biacentes and Culebrenses end up sleeping in their cars when they come here, if they have cars. Sometimes they will sleep in the street to go to the doctor because even though there are plenty of Airbnbs around, unfortunately, they're they're not affordable really for for all of the people of Vieques and Culebra. Um, so one minute left. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> um I would actually like to invite everyone who's listening, everyone who's watching, please. I'm gonna put my my email in the chat as well. It's Monisha, M-O-N-I-S-H-A at central, C-E-N-T-R-O-S-P-R.org. I would like to host an information session about the project um, and invite people to contribute. Um, we're desperate for help. Um, we're not a nonprofit. We're just people uh, who see the need and are trying to do something to respond to that need. Um, we are in the process of applying for fiscal sponsorship with Alliance for Global Justice. Um, in addition to that, we are looking at creating a, a land trust at the national level, national meaning Puerto Rico, so that a lot of the displacement that was mentioned in the videos, um, we can help facilitate a block. We can disrupt that pattern of displacement as much as we can. <laughs> and then my minute's over. Um, and so I can give all of the rest of the information another time somehow some way okay. it's really okay if you want to finish <laughs> oh, thanks we're not a big time crunch so take your time oh, i appreciate it um and then the, the international component is with soli puerto rico which is the the international solidarity group of puerto ricans um doing work on that front um but right now our main focus our main priority is getting this house up and running because as we know the intentional medical neglect of the state kills people. As we know, um, what has taken place here, just in our region of Puerto Rico, the, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg with what's actually happening here and how many people are suffering here and, and what the situation is actually like. But we need help and, and, and we need resources. Um, we don't really have time to wait on the process of becoming a nonprofit in order to serve our people, in order to meet this need because people are dying right now. Um, so we're really hopeful for, you know, as we do go through that process, because we don't have a choice at this point to get the resources we need. Everyone wants us to be a nonprofit um, and a business, um, which blows my mind. Um, but our goal, as you can see, if you follow the link that Libre put in the chat, that goes to the fundraising page that we started. The number there is $300,000. What that will do is pay off the um, house loan. It will pay off the vehicle loan because we have a van. We also help transport people to their appointments as we can. Um, it will pay those off, but it would also give us the money that we need to set this house up for the climate crisis, to be able to survive it, to make sure that we have a proper solar system 
to make sure that our retaining wall, which is following, following, falling down now, thanks to Hurricane Fiona um, and landslides, um, that we have a proper retaining wall in place, that we have wheelchair accessibility, that we have everything that we need here to be able to safely provide a respite um, for people who have suffered entirely too much and never deserved any bit of it. Well, thank you for the extra time. Thank you everyone for hearing me out. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monisha Rios, for that overview and then for uh, sharing with us about your project um, and to Libre and Lorraine for posting additional info in the chat. Um, I definitely encourage people to donate and to learn more about the project. And uh, that's great. There'll be an upcoming info session. Um, to just say also, uh, I think, you know, uh, one of the discussions that's coming out early on in the COP 27 in the Conference of Parties United Nations Climate Conference taking place in Egypt right now is a lot about uh, the unequal impacts of climate change, um, which we see very clearly through the videos and through just the little you've been able to share in our short time in Puerto Rico. Um, but and, and it's come out really clearly how much governments Government of Canada and the United States, especially, have not been paying into uh, the funds that are necessary for developing countries to to really save lives and to prepare for these, uh, you know, floods, fires, droughts, um, and all of this. Uh, you know, it's the responsibility of the world's most polluting countries, and you know who that is. That's the United States and Canada. Actually, Canada has the highest GHG input uh, footprint of any G20 country, because there's not very many people in Canada, but Canada produces a lot of oil and gas and people in Canada consume a lot. So, you know, it is the government of Canada's responsibility in a lot of ways to pay into the funds to help developing countries. But somewhere like Puerto Rico might not be even eligible for those funds because Puerto Rico is not an independent country. Puerto Rico is supposedly getting support from the government of the United States and they're not. So I think that that's one of the ways that Puerto Rico becomes so important and we can see how just directly tied uh, the struggle for independence is to people in Puerto Rico being able to even you know, mitigate the impact of climate change or access the funding, uh, the little funding that's available and just shows how necessary um, your work is, which is both raising awareness internationally and then trying to do what you can in, in your community. So I really, um, yeah, appreciate your time and for sharing that uh, with us here today. Um, I did want to say that we're going to open up for questions and answers. So uh, there is a Q&A box kind of in the middle of your screen, whatever sort of device you're participating in. Feel free to type there and then Monisha can kind of take a look <laughs> and prepare a bit. Um, but while you gather your thoughts, I do have a few announcements. And um, I wanted to just take a second to tie again back to what we're talking about here today, building an international climate justice movement. So the first thing is um, we are going to post in the chat a petition. Uh, it's coming from an organization in the United States called the Alliance for Global Justice. It's a group that does, uh, you know, help uh, nonprofits with fiscal sponsorship and does a lot of different uh, work in the area of social and climate justice. But in particular, they're hosting a letter on their website, which people can sign on to. And this letter is regarding Luma, so the company that is part owned by ADCO, ADCO based in Alberta, um, Alberta, which is a, a letter addressed to Pedro Perluisi, who is the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, and so I encourage people to sign the letter and also to share it with others. Um, we will, in the coming period, be talking more about ATCO and maybe how we can uh, target them uh, for their privatization and their role in the privatization of Puerto Rico's electrical grid and their neglect of the people of Puerto Rico. Com the company ATCO is also involved uh, just looking through their project list, or, you know, oil and gas, no surprise, and other actually military projects. They have involvement in NATO flying training across Canada, for example, um, which causes um, horrible, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. These new fighter jets, as we've talked about before by the government of Canada, contribute tenfold um, the emissions 
uh, that, um, you know, of a, of a car driving down the road in just a matter of seconds. So um, we'll talk more about that. But again, I encourage people to sign on to this letter to end the contract with Luma, reinstate PREPA and the uh, UTIER union. Um, so sign on to that letter and share, please. Uh, next, uh, wanted to uh, kind of tie some of what Manisha was saying back to here in Canada. So I think, you know, very clearly the environmental racism, which is a term that can sometimes be used to describe, you know, the can cancer, uh, the health impacts of pollution or of military bombing. Um, we see that too in Canada. It's, it's no surprise to Indigenous people in Canada to hear about persistent mercury poisoning, for example. You know, the government's supposed to be responsible for cleaning that up, but people in Grassy Narrows have for over 60 years faced mercury poisoning um, due to a, um, a mill, a pulp and paper mill that was built upstream of their water source and have been fighting for justice for that for, like I said, 60 years. So uh, these uh, ties are really, you know, concrete and directly there, not only between Canada um, and poor working and oppressed people in Canada and people in Puerto Rico, but also countries around the world. Um, and one of the ongoing struggles we wanted to highlight here at tonight's webinar was around uh, the struggle against the coastal gas link and tr trans mountain expansion pipelines taking place uh, currently here in British Columbia. The Trudeau Liberal government and the BC government have continued to give lip service to environmental concerns, indigenous rights. We'll hear a lot about this at COP27 in the next few days, of Canada being a green country, um, but they have pressed ahead with massive resource extraction projects with disregard both. They don't care about people and the planet, and neither do the oil and gas companies that they heavily subsidize. And uh, so that is what makes the struggle to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which is uh, technically uh, and in its entirety owned by the government of Canada, paid for by taxpayers in Canada, uh, was bought in 2018 by the Trudeau Liberal government uh, for uh, around $6 billion, and now it's cost estimated at $21.4 billion and counting of taxpayer money that could be spent on housing, healthcare, education, a whole number of social justice issues. Um, but people continue to fight back. So that's where I wanted to start with our local updates. And Kirsten, uh, if you're there, uh, then now is your time. Um, we uh, have been uh, supporting as Climate Convergence, you know, many different actions against the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project. And an important development just in the last few weeks has been a camp uh, at Stony Creek in Burnaby, British Columbia, where uh, land defenders and water protectors like Kirsten are taking a stand against this environmentally destructive project that also tramples on the rights of indigenous people, and in particular, the Tsleil-Waututh people whose um, land the pipeline is, is currently crossing. Um, so Kirsten's gonna give us an update uh, and a little bit of a hello from Stony Creek Camp. Uh, she is outside. <laughs> So it is dark. It is nighttime here in British Columbia, right. but it's great to see you. Go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Hi, everyone. Yeah, we're here under the bridge at Stony Creek. Um, we've been here for over two weeks now. Um, just monitoring what TMX is up to here because the salmon run just started in Stony Creek like a day after we arrived. The drought, uh, you guys knew the drought that it was here for weeks. The salmon weren't able to move, so it rained and all the salmon came upstream. So we've been here ever since, just watching, um, keeping an eye on what they're doing. Uh, we did get arrested last week. We tried to keep the Burnaby Urban Trail open um, and they moved the signs and shut it down and arrested us. So now we're just five meters outside of the fence here under the bridge watching the salmon. We'll be here for at least another week. Um, just keeping an eye on everything and yeah, showing you guys the salmon that are coming through. This is a, a huge run um, and it was 
just brought back because for years it was gone it was uh this creek was so unstable and they just got it back to having fish run in again and we've got tmx running their pipe 15 meters away from this salmon run and they couldn't stop they didn't slow down sorry that's the sky train. um they haven't slowed down or stopped at all i actually think they ramped up work once they heard that the salmon were here, I swear it was ridiculous. So, and they've got that drill right over top of the creek. Uh, so we're just waiting to see what's happening. They're they're slow. They're always behind on on work. So we're just waiting to see. And that's about it here. Uh, I know we do tours on Sundays and Wednesdays at one p.m. If anybody wants to come down and see the salmon or see what we're doing down here. That's great, uh, Kirsten. And do you want to share just a few words about why why you are there? Why you're against the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Um, um, Protect the Planet called me. Tim Takaro called me from Protect the Planet and said, and I was in hope when they drove through the Coquihalla and killed the salmon run there. And honestly, we're at a point in all of our lives right now when we are, it's either we're for profit or we're for the people. And what I'm seeing happen in Canada over my life is for profits, not once for the people. And I'm worried about my children's future and my grandchildren's future. So I've given up the rest of my year to come here to fight the TMX as well, to go up north to fight the CGL pipeline because they're doing even worse things up in the north that not a lot of people know about it. They have their own policing system, CERG, as you know, for the CGL pipeline, and, and they're turning the indigenous into terrorists up there for trying to fight for the land and for the water. So I'm just one person trying to protect the Stony Creek stream and, and protect our land, protect our water for our future children, because it's bleak. Thank you. Thank you for joining Kirsten and, um, you know, for, for doing this important work at the Stony Creek camp, which I encourage people to visit. We're posting in the chat how you can visit and support the camp, support the work of Protect the Planet, Stop TMX, is a, uh, which Climate Convergence is a part of, um, you know, is doing the work that the government is supposed to be doing. Trans Mountain, like I said, is owned by the government of Canada but they're still supposed to be following environmental regulations, protecting the salmon, protecting hummingbirds, other vital species and habitat. And instead it's up to people to go and point out to the government and say, look at this toxic water pouring into the creek as the salmon are trying to go upstream to spawn. Look what is happening and come and do something about it. And we've seen time and time again, the federal government um, is ignoring the obvious viola environmental violations of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the same way they ignored the obvious health violations. In the middle of the, the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, people were on the ground observing workers for Trans Mountain uh, who were working in unsafe conditions and reporting it and saying, look, government, you're not following your own regulations. Of course, I don't think we can expect the federal government to police themselves but we can demand it and we can demand that they follow their own rules and regulations and that is an integral part of working to stop uh, this destruction and and this horrible project which is the trans mountain pipeline expansion so thank you kirsten for for being us <laughs> with us here tonight and uh again the link is in the chat for how you can go and support the stony creek camp thank, thank you guys so much we will win so that was land defender and water protector Kirsten. Um, I wanted to say just a few words about the other project which she mentioned, which is the coastal gas link pipeline. Uh, there is drilling happening under the Wudzinkwa, the river, uh, the sacred headwaters of the Wet'suwet'en people uh, in northern British Columbia and Wet'suwet'en territory for the coastal gas link project, which is a fracked gas so-called natural gas pipeline. I know actually in Puerto Rico, there was a big struggle around a liquefied natural gas pipeline as well. Um, but here in British Columbia, it is being uh, rammed through under the guise of the BC NDP government. Again, the federal government giving massive subsidies as well to this project, uh, which is uh, violating um, 
the the rights of the indigenous people of Wet'suwet'en, hereditary chiefs whose land this pipeline crosses have stood adamantly against it, and land defenders, uh, Wet'suwet'en people and their allies face constant harassment, police brutality um, at the hands of the RCMP and other police forces because of their peaceful defense of the land. But drilling has begun under this river, and um, in response to that, people across Canada are coming together more and more to oppose this project, uh, which will admit about the same amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as 1.7 million cars yearly, if it goes ahead. Um, the coastal gas link project feeds into the LNG Canada project, the liquefied natural gas Canada project, which is what will emit uh, those greenhouse gases, including methane, which is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than, than carbon dioxide. Um, so like I was saying, this coastal gas link pipeline resistance to that pipeline is growing. Um, I want to encourage people uh, to come out to the next climate convergence meeting. We're talking about how to support uh, the work of the decolonial solidarity, which is organizing regular actions against the coastal gas link pipeline and uh, to organize uh, events and actions in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who are standing up against this pipeline. And um, so there'll be some links in the chat regarding that as well. And um, we, uh, while I'm on that, the next climate convergence meeting happens to be tomorrow. It's at seven o'clock and it is held on Zoom currently. So I encourage people uh, to come and, and see what it's about, can participate in discussion, help us plan upcoming events and actions, more webinars such as this one. And um, there'll be information in the chat about how to join, uh, but you can always email climateconvergence604 at gmail.com for more information. Again, it is Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m. is our next organizing meeting. And then our next action is November 16th at the corner of Fraser and 49th in Vancouver. So Fraser Avenue and 49th Street in Vancouver. Uh, there's going to be an action for a uh, people and planet before pipelines and profit. Uh, there's uh, four banks on that busy intersection, all of which are the banks that are heavily financing and supporting projects such as the Coastal Gas Link and Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. So we're going to hold an intersection action, which is info tabling, a light sign display, and marching around the intersection to draw attention to these projects and encourage people to get involved in the struggle against these pipelines and for climate justice. We'll put more information about those events in the chat as well. Um, but wherever you're joining us here from today, I want to just encourage people to get involved in your struggle for climate justice and to take what we've learned today also back to your local organizations. And let's work on building those ties of solidarity and uh, with uh, folks like Monisha who are fighting on the ground in Puerto Rico. Brings us to the question and answer period. <laughs> Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, encourage people, you can type them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we do have time for discussion here tonight. And uh, any other comments or anything you'd like to share, please, the chat, chat is open for you. Um, so the first uh, question says, thank you, Monisha, for bringing uh, all this important information to us. With many cases of US NATO foreign military bases or military bases on occupied and indigenous lands, what kind of networks and coordination is there uh, between places like Okinawa, Hawaii, et cetera, to resist both foreign occupation and the climate destruction they impose? Go I ahead. love this question. I really do. So um, the Ryukyu people, in what has been colonized as Okinawa. Um, they were in Vieque with us. Um, they went to be on our front lines um, with us. And I had the privilege of being invited to go be on theirs with them. Um, and to see the way that we uh, learn from each other in terms of tactics, um, as well as support each other, you know, and keep up our morale and everything. And so, um, the beauty of the solidarity that is, it exists between the islands that are being used the way that they're being used, including in Hawaii, 
Um, there are many uh, Puerto Ricans who have been doing solidarity work long, long, long before I have. Um, and so these relationships have been around for a long time. Um, and um, yeah, with Hawaii, there's a long history of Puerto Rican presence in Hawaii as well. So there's a love between our people. There's um, a deep understanding of our struggle um, that we have that I think is there's there's a particular aspect to the way that islands in particular are treated by the US and NATO. Think about the Mariana Islands as well, um, Jeju Island um, and other places where, you know, for some reason we are chosen to be the testing grounds. Um, so and, and the, also the the compassion and empathy that we have for each other around the sexual violence that accompanies all of that as well is very strong. Um, also, naturally, because of class, because of the economic situations being what they are for the majority of us, it's hard for us to be present with each other um, in our struggles like we would like to be. Um, but we are there in spirit and always holding each other um, through the, the pain and the laughter and the singing and the resistance. Thank you. Yeah, we've, you know, we've, um, Climate Convergence has had a number of webinars and in-person conferences before then to really also elevate um, the environmental impact of, of the military. The U.S. military, if it, you know, was a country, would be the world's biggest climate destroyer. Pollution and um, emissions are, you know, through the roof. In Canada, also the Canadian uh, the military of Canada is also a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and, um, you know, poisoning of lands both here in Canada and abroad. Um, and I think, uh, you know, whatever comes out of COP27, it is surely not going to touch at all uh, the military and uh, NATO, the United States, Canada, all of these countries. Um, they report emissions, but they're actually totally exempt from reporting on emissions related to the military. Those are considered like a matter of national security and countries don't even have to report them. And I very much think that um, we are not going to be able to, to build a better world, a sustainable world, a just world um, without also ending wars, occupations and uh, foreign military bases. Um, let alone, as you said, the the social impacts of, of having a, a military base. Um, so thank you to Janine for that question and, and Monisha for answering. Um, Max says, thanks Monisha for this informative talk on Puerto Rico. I'm looking forward to your upcoming info session. I believe there is a media blackout on the struggle of Puerto Ricans uh, within Canada. Um, can you talk more about the demonstrations in Puerto Rico against Luma and also demonstrations against the displacement of Puerto Ricans by wealthy foreigners. Yeah. Um, before I get into Max's excellent question, I, I do want for folks to know that um, the commonly quoted number of US military bases abroad is around 800, but that's a gross underestimation. Um, according to the DOD zone documents, um, and whoever does come to my info session, um, I'm happy to provide those. Also, my dissertation should be published like before the end of the year, I hope, and that information's in there as well. Um, but it's more like 4,800. Uh, uh, it used to be on the DOD's website, but now you have to dig for it. But it's uh, approximately 4,800 defense sites on all seven continents in over 160 countries is what they commonly quote. Um, and that the Depart US Department of Defense, Defense is the largest owner of property in the entire world. Um, and it's like 27 million something acres that they have. Um, so that's the actual picture of the US military presence, not including NATO allies, um, joint base operations and so on and so forth. Um, so um, to Max's question, um, and thank you, Max. Thank you also, Janine. Um, yes, there is, there is a blackout. 
I think also beyond Canada, um, there's a lot of misinformation about Puerto Rico. If information about Puerto Rico does in fact reach anyone's ears, um, the the demonstrations against Luma have been going on for for years now, um, and they've been big. They've been huge. Um, I was in one. Um, and this, there's smaller ones as well. So there's local ones where people will take their damaged appliances, they will take their rotten food and dump it on on the the Luma um, like headquarters in their municipalities um, and things. So the demonstrations are ongoing. There's also um, a non-payment strike, basically, kind of like a debt strike, but where people are like, we're not paying the bill. I haven't paid the bill in a year. I ha they haven't shut me off yet, but um, also Libre and Lorraine probably will put more information about that in the chat as well. Um, people are calling to end the contract. So a lot of the manifestations or protests that, that are taking place are demanding an end to the contract. Um, and so then to the other question against the displacement. So, The thing is that right now here, there are so many fires happening at the same time. Displacement's just one of them. Um, and we're a small country. Uh, a lot of us have left. There are now more Puerto Ricans living outside of Puerto Rico than here in the archipelago. Um, and people are tired. The community leaders are carrying a lot of weight and they're trying to respond to everything, including the displacement, including all of the austerity measures, the cuts of pensions, um, the healthcare crisis, all of it. Um, so there are, there have been demonstrations upon demonstrations upon demonstrations for all of these issues. Um, much of them stay hidden even in Puerto Rican media. Uh, so the place to go to find more information, um, one place is a call to action on Puerto Rico. They have a Facebook group. Um, Lorraine can probably put that information in the chat. Um, another one is New York Boricua Resistance. A lot of the diaspora groups do cover what's happening. Um, um, but yeah, looking to um, Bianca Gralau, who, who was the first video on Culebra, that's another great source, as well as um, Centro Periodismo Investi. Yeah, I'm trying to remember it. Uh, the the it's like a investigative journalism center, I think, is the translation. So it's it's kind of like a people's media. Um, oh yes, Libre put a, another great uh, source in the chat. So that would be a way of countering the blackout, um, uh, the lack of information that you all are are not getting, um, and especially countering the the psychological warfare narratives around um, how happy we are here. Um, but also Bitcoin. Um, we're not a fan of Bitcoin here. Bitcoin is the new wave of colonialism here. It's just the new money. So the majority of our colonizers now are, are Bitcoin colonizers. They're the Bitcoin bros. They're the Brock Pierces and the, the Jake Pauls and, and his sibling. These are the people now who are pushing us out. These are the people who are the absentee landlords. These are the people who are making it impossible for us to afford to pay rent or even to have a place to rent. These are the people who are driving up the, the cost of housing and, and, and intentionally, you know. Um, and that goes along also, the displacement is directly tied to the tourism industry. So don't come to Puerto Rico as a tourist. So don't come here. <laughs> yes, come here. We love you. We want to share our culture with you. We want to eat together and dance and sing and, and be family, but don't come here to buy us out. Don't come here to, to impose yourself upon us and be a bad neighbor. You know, don't be a bad guest. Um, but that's what's happening. A lot of people will come. The tourism industry here is basically the try before you buy your second or third home. Um, so... I'll get off my soapbox now. 
<laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> Thank you for all of the resources that Libra and Lorena are putting yeah. in the chat for you. Yeah, this is excellent. Um, yeah, that, thanks, Libra. Yeah, we, that's, I mean, we want to talk about in the in the coming period, yeah, how we can um, work to support this campaign against Luma from here uh, in Canada. Um, the at, ATCO company is in Alberta. If anyone here on us in the webinar is from Alberta, let, let, make yourself known and let's talk. Um, but yes, uh, definitely. Uh, thank you for all of the information and, and for helping us uh, begin to understand how we can link our struggles. And um, I don't see kind of any other questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, so just if there's any I, kind of closing comments that you'd like to make uh, before we close off today, this webinar will be available online and, and encourage people to to share it with others so that we can um, work from here uh, to build this stronger and, and more united international climate justice movement uh, that is also a movement against uh, wars, occupations, colonialism, and for indigenous rights and self-determination. But uh, Monisha, yeah, if you have any final words, please. I just have a ton of gratitude to you, to everyone at Climate Convergence, um, uh, to everyone who came and attended and, and listened and asked questions and, um, please do, um, contact me, um, for more information about Centro Solidario. Um, we do really need support. Um, and we want to, to eventually be a source of information for people as well. Right now we don't have capacity. So, we, so, you know, helping us to build our capacity to, to not only, survive all of these things but to participate and 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 live in solidarity with all of you too and show up for you too um because puerto rico is a part of the world we're an island but we're not an island unto ourselves or islands i should say uh and and so it's important for us as well we want to show up in a good way uh and be in your struggles with you too because it's all connected and we're all in this together so thank you so much and thank you to the elder who did the beautiful prayer. Oh. Yeah, Coast Salish elder Kelly White, thank you. Um, she had a big event all day as the reason we recorded the video and um, she would, she's um, not here now, but I will share that um, thank you with her as well. Um, this has been, I, I think, a, a great webinar. Um, as I said, to open discussion, to start thinking more about how we can stand in solidarity with people of Puerto Rico. Um, the donation links are in the chat, the kind of get involved, more information links are in the chat. I really encourage people to copy them and share them. Um, also, uh, we just posted the um, links for Climate Convergence's website and social media, and you can find more information there where we'll be sharing about these important campaigns and uh, trying to do what we can to uh, talk more about the international struggle and how it connects so directly to what we are organizing here for um, in British Columbia, in Canada. Uh, there's one atmosphere, one ecosystem. Uh, the, climate justice movement must be international. Um, and just to highlight, you know, the, the massive oil and gas corporations, not limited to ATCO, but also, you know, all of them that are integral in, in our lives here in developed countries, especially and in developing countries, kind of everywhere around the world, these companies are the ones that are responsible for the vast majority of greenhouse gas uh, emissions globally, uh, the governments that enable their destruction uh, such as the government of Canada, or the United States, especially, uh, you know, are the ones that are bringing about the destruction of the planet. And uh, so we really have to work um, to reverse this horrible situation and bring about a better, just and more sustainable world. Um, I see your hand, Monisha, I'll give you one second. I just want to finish this thought was just, just to say that one thing that struck me from Bianca Gorlau's film, especially was uh, one of the people that she mentioned uh, that was causing forced displacement on, on the island and uh, was bringing about gentrification was in fact someone that sold solar panels. And I think that rings true for me in the way that 
in climate convergence, we're often trying and discussing, you know, like green capitalism is not the solution. Um, and I think that's unfortunately an angering, you know, you can see the example in, in Puerto Rico. It's very angering and, and frustrating to learn about, but you can see so clearly how some of what is causing actually further environmental destruction and like social breakdown are these people with these green capitalist ideas. And that's why we've talked so much about why we don't just need a, a green face on a capitalist system. We need real system change. And so um, that's just one thought I wanted to share at the end, but Manisha, go ahead. Thank you, I apologize. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that would be really helpful, um, especially for us in Vieques and Culebra, is if you all up in Canada have any way of finding out what weapons Canada used. Like, we don't get that information from the Navy. During one of the community meetings where I was present, I raised the question of, you know, are other nations who also bombed us to smithereens participating in the cleanup and or can we get information about what did they use? Because we need to know what's impacting us. It will help us be better self-advocates for our healthcare if we know what we're contending with. Um, so that would be a super awesome help. Um, and in addition to, to Centro Solidario, I'm going actually soon this month to Vietnam for a peace conference there. And there we'll be able to have an opportunity to talk with folks um, because preparation for Vietnam was done in Vieque. And the same weapons were used here that were used there. And so we're living with the same illnesses. And um, going on that trip will allow us to maybe possibly get more information from them that we're not getting from the states and also to learn ways that they themselves are recovering. Um, and for to support that trip, um, I just need 205 more dollars to, to pay the, the plane ticket. Um, so it, you can put that in the Centro Solidario uh, bucket because um, it will go to, to that as well. But thank you. Thank you for letting me add that. Yeah, of course. And Dow Chemicals, which was integral in the development of napalm used to deforest Vietnam and, and has continued lasting effects to today, uh, was developed in Canada. So there's always this uh, horrible connection between the ways that the, the government of Canada has been side by side with the United States and all of their uh, bloody wars and occupations. So um, yeah, uh, if anyone out there, I mean, we'll share it in our networks, doctors and, and researchers um, wants to help find that information uh, about what weaponry was used in Vieques, then that would be great. And, and, and we'll keep working together, Monisha, for sure. I uh, wish you safe travels safe journey um, on your in your trip. And um, I know that we will now be in closer touch with one another and uh, we'll continue this work and uh, we'll, um, you know, I, I think every every webinar we hear, uh, we try and focus not only on the hor destructive things that are happening around the world, but on how people are fighting back and how people are organizing and resisting. And I think that your work and uh, the work of many people in Puerto Rico for, for me and for others has always been an inspiration, you know, especially from the battle to kick the US Navy out of Vieques until today. So uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. I know it's getting late for you, um, but uh, here we are, you know, we'll be side by side in these these trenches and uh, we'll be fighting for this better, just and more sustainable world. I uh, encourage people to donate and uh, to get involved in, in climate convergence as well. So hope to see you at the meeting tomorrow and uh, together we will win. Venceremos, they say in Spanish. <laughs> Thank you.